Good morning. My name is Diren Ansborough and I'm the Head of Legal and Policy at the Irish Council for Civil Liberties. I'm delighted to be here uh, virtually this morning and uh, I hope you all uh, very much enjoy the day. So my presentation is on international standards on judicial conduct and ethics. Um, in this presentation, I'll first have a look at the international human rights framework. Uh, this specific standards on independence of the judiciary. Key content for codes of conduct and ethics. Watch outs when drafting codes or things to watch out for basically. And next steps in Ireland uh, following the drafting of uh, uh, guidelines on conduct and ethics. So to begin, uh, a look at the human rights framework uh, and the relevance of the human rights framework to our discussions today on uh, drafting judicial uh, codes of conduct and ethics. So the starting point as ever is the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and of course the right to a fair trial. Um, Article 10 holds everyone is entitled in full equality to a fair and public hearing by an independent and impartial tribunal. We see that article reflected in the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and of course in the European Convention on Human Rights where the requirements of an independent and impartial tribunal um, are very clearly set out. And many uh, international human rights experts have emphasized the importance of the uh, you know, an independent and impartial tribunal, not just to uh, fulfilling the right to a fair trial, but also for instilling confidence in the rule of law itself. We also have the very clear positive obligation to combat discrimination in a number of UN human rights treaties. There is of course the common uh, anti-discrimination article across the, the human rights treaties, but in particular we have the UN Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women and the UN Convention on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, both of which require a competent, independent and impartial tribunal to provide an effective remedy against acts of either uh, uh, discrimination against women or racial discrimination. In terms of connecting that uh, requirement of independence and impartiality to the, co the concept and, and the uh, context of a judicial uh, code of conduct uh, uh, or indeed uh, of ethics, um, the Special Rapporteur on the Independence of Judges and Lawyers, I think put it very well in her report to the Human Rights Council in 2014, where she said the principle of the independence of the judiciary is not aimed at benefiting judges themselves, but at protecting individuals from abuses of power and ensuring that court users are given a fair and impartial hearing. As a consequence, judges cannot act arbitrarily by deciding cases according to their own personal preferences. Their duty is the fair and impartial application of the law. Judges must therefore be accountable for their actions and conduct so that the public can have full confidence in the ability of the judiciary to carry out its functions independently and impartially. So we, the, we see the importance there of uh, connecting conduct and accountability to uh, ensuring uh, confidence in, in, in um, an independent and impartial uh, judiciary. So the question is, have international experts addressed the issue of judicial independence? The answer is yes, as you can see from these uh, many sources relating to standards uh, uh, elaborated at the international level on the independence of the judiciary, how to uh, ensure it, um, and indeed the, the, the various different aspects uh, where um, required to ensure uh, the independence and impartiality of the judiciary. Um, I'm not going to go through them all, and I think many of the other speakers here today will go into some of these sources in, in a lot more detail than I will have time to um, now. Uh, but just a very quick run through. Uh, in 1981, we saw the draft principles on the independence of the judiciary. Uh, in 1982, minimum standards of judicial independence were adopted by the International Bar Association. 
1985, we had a very significant uh, drafting of the United Nations basic principles on the independence of the judiciary. And these basic principles are still probably one of the most authoritative uh, sources of uh, standards in relation to safeguarding the independence of the judiciary. We then have a draft universal declaration on the independence of justice, known as the Singvi Declaration. The Committee of Ministers of the Council of Europe have uh, spent uh, a, a lot of time and effort elaborating recommendations relating to the independence, efficiency and role and responsibility of judges, and they outline very specific standards for members of the Council of Europe. With the Beijing Statement of Principles, European Charter on the Statute for Judges, the Universal Charter of the Judge, Latimer House Guidelines relating to uh, elaborated for, for the Commonwealth, um, authoritative opinions from the Consultative Council of European Judges, and then you have the Bangalore Principles of Judicial Conduct elaborated in 2002, which uh, the next speaker, of course, will be speaking about in, in great detail. So I will um, maybe just give a, a little whistle a whistle stop tour of those principles. You then have um, further standards um, being elaborated by international experts, including the Special Rapporteur, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and the Human Rights Council has a regular uh, resolution on the independence of, of, of judges, uh, uh, which is uh, um, approved and negotiated uh, annually. So just a very quick look into some of these and the more important I suppose, sources uh, relating to standards on the independence of the judiciary, in particular with reference to uh, standards relating to judicial conduct um, and, and, and codes of ethics. So if we start with the UN principles uh, uh, on the independence of the judiciary, uh, principle 19 is, is the most relevant one here, which states that all disciplinary suspension or removal proceedings shall be determined in accordance with established standards of judicial conduct, so that um, that requirement of establishing very clear standards of judicial conduct is something we'll see again and again throughout those um, throughout those sources. I think principle eight is is also very relevant of the UN basic principles. Um, it comes under the section relating to the rights of judges themselves, um, and we see here members of the judiciary are like other citizens entitled to freedom of expression, belief, association, and assembly. Provided, however, that in exercising such rights, judges shall always conduct themselves in such a manner as to preserve the dignity of their office and the impartiality and independence of the judiciary. So we can see that there is a requirement of, of particular conduct in principle eight. Um, looking at the Bangalore principles on judicial conduct, we see six particular requirements uh, for, uh, for codes of conduct. Um, the, the Bangalore principles engage with the principles of independence, impartiality, integrity, propriety, equality, competence, and diligence. And you're going to hear a, a lot more about those six principles uh, in the next presentation. So I won't go into too much detail now. Um, I think it's important to note that there have been uh, further uh, uh, instruments elaborated to assist with the implementation of these principles, including the measures for effective implementation of the Bangalore principles elaborated by the Judicial Integrity Group. And these uh, measures consist of two parts. The first uh, relates to measures required to be adopted by the judiciary. And principle one there um, is the formulation of a statement of principles of judicial conduct. So um, you might say Ireland is a little behind since we don't currently have one, but of course it is being worked on um, as we speak. Part two is about institutional arrangements required to ensure judicial independence and exclusively within the competence of the state. Um, so that's uh, the requirement of the state to ensure that the judiciary remains independent um, even through uh, disciplinary proceedings and that, and that those um, I suppose those kind of proceedings relating to uh, established codes of conduct are very much remain within the uh, within the, the remit of the judiciary itself. So what I'm calling watch outs here uh, uh, are basically general principles to ensure are respected and upheld 
uh, when these kind of codes are being uh, drafted. Firstly, I think uh, of great importance is that the judiciary itself has to be involved in, in drafting the code of ethics and conduct. And of course, we know the, the Judicial Council is in charge of, of drafting our code here. So that's positive. The rights of the judges, uh, the rights of judges must be upheld. So, of course, um, we, we should see reference to the rights of judges themselves, potentially within this code of conduct. Any disciplinary proceedings related um, to this code or based on the code uh, must be underpinned by fair procedures and it may be good practice to uh, elaborate on those procedures um, when we are elaborating on the code itself. Any sanctions related to um, uh, dis disciplinary proceedings must be proportionate um, and definitions uh, need to be clear within, within the code. Um, I worked previously in Tunisia when the judiciary was elaborating its code of conduct and you know, for the International Commission of Jurists, and one of the one of the key criticisms we had at that time uh, were that was that uh, certain um, concepts weren't defined um, accurately or clearly. Uh, so, for example, shortcomings in performance uh, was was one uh, was one um, element of 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 a uh, a more general sort of. Um, code where, where, where a judiciary could be held accountable for a shortcoming in performance, which of course uh, it, it goes against the, the principle of, of uh, clarity in relation to any misconduct that, that a judge could be held accountable for. So um, just looking now at the next steps in Ireland, just to kind of smoothly transition to, to, the, to the next few speakers uh, today. Um, I, of course, we have guidelines on judicial conduct and ethics um, having been drafted, and they are to be adopted by the Judicial Council, uh, I believe, by June 2022, according to the, to the relevant statute. Um, an informal resolution process is to be implemented and a procedure for making complaints, and I believe the, the Judicial Council has committed to both of these steps in, in September 2020. Um, and I suppose one thing I might leave you with is, uh, uh, is whether to consider um, practical guidance that would accompany uh, the guidelines on, on conduct and ethics uh, for interpreting the, 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 go the code, uh, in particular to make it clear and accessible to judges, uh, decision makers, and of course, the public. Uh, and that kind of brings us back to the idea that ultimately all of these actions are about uh, ensuring that everybody has confidence in our judiciary, but also in the rule of law. Thank you for listening and uh, enjoy the rest of the day.